Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our wonderful Wednesday. Let's start our morning with Power of Dreams programming and let's roll the day. So let's start it. More power to each of our dreams. Let them all come to fruition. And let's start this wonderful Wednesday without learning a bit more. So let's start with the body and let's see what Luke has to guide us in our journey. All right. So yes, a lot of us have been loving potatoes, but not been eating for fear of them making us fat or whatever reasons. Today, let's understand why we should eat potatoes, lifestyle number 27. The truth is potatoes don't make you fat. Poor lifestyle, overconsumption or deep fried potatoes do. Cutting out potatoes may help you lose a little weight. However, my approach is to allow most of my clients to eat potatoes every day, but in the right way and in the right quantity. For the longest of time, people have made out potatoes to be really bad. But the fact is they contain a lot of nutrients and vitamins that can help your immunity and weight loss. Please don't get diabetes by eating potatoes. People don't get eating diabetes by eating potatoes. They get sick first and then are not allowed to eat too many potatoes because of the sugar levels. Potatoes are a rich source of vitamin B6, which is essential for energy metabolism. Vitamin B6 helps convert carbs into glucose and also breaks some protein into amino acids. So although potato is given a bad name, yet potato isn't bad. It's just a carbohydrate and a starch. There's absolutely nothing wrong with either of those if they're digested and broken down the right way. Potatoes are also rich in folates, which are used by cells for synthesis and repair of DNA. So they're good to eat for cancer patients because they help with DNA synthesis and repair. As all mutations of cancer cells are a result of the mutation in your DNA. The right amount of folates in your body as aids the process as well. So let's understand that potatoes are great. Now, what all is there which is not allowed is something that we all understand. But we are not eating it sensibly. So hence the, the huge thing about potatoes not being allowed. Potatoes become unhealthy when you deep fry them because they absorb so much oil. So French fries are completely, uh, you know, over-exaggerated, not, not should, should never be had. Overeating them too is harmful, is so as overeating any other fruit or vegetable. Remember, the human body will use only what it needs for its functions. Anything extra is likely to get stored as fat or as impurity. Apart from the nutrient mentioned above, potatoes contain iron, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, zinc, all of which contribute to bone health. India has a high number of cases of osteoporosis, patients of which can benefit from eating these vegetables. 
Also, iron and zinc found in potatoes lead to the production of collagen, which is essential for bone formation. So potassium in your body can lead to vessel dilation, which can actually reduce high blood pressure. As potatoes are loaded with potassium, they have direct impact on reducing high blood pressure. <clears throat> Similarly, this vegetable can help with inflammation because of the choline content in it. Importantly, choline also reduces the absorption of fat into cells. So I think having heard all of this as above, if you are looking at eating potatoes in a sensible form, it's never a bad idea. It may be eating as a normal vegetable, maybe eating as a tikki, it's never bad. But yeah, if you're free frying it, deep frying it, it's really, really, really harmful. So yeah, let's understand that it is going to help us in our body as long as we are more sensible about it. Time for the last magic chapter for the series. And that's very beautiful. So you, a lot of you will be confused and I'll explain to you why. So day 28 is remember the magic. So Charles E. Lynn says, who's a writer and a Celtic folk musician, he says, that's the thing with magic. You've got to know it's still here all around us or it just stays invisible for you. So very important for each one of us to understand that what we have been doing in the last first say 27 days, 26 days, is what we're supposed to be continuing henceforth. So when you look at uh, Rhonda Burns book and she says, write down gratitude for till the 28th day, it's writing any 10 forms of gratitude for anything generic in your life, which you have been blessed with any time ever. But what I have made you do is to make your uh, gratitude more integrated within you. I have requested you to write gratitude of the previous day. And that is what today is all the exercise is all about. So I've actually fast forward this exercise into intertwined into everyday practice. So for those of you who are having a problem finding something new, that's why I said write generic stuff because it is very much part of the curriculum or the book's teachings. So in what we have to do henceforth is find something unique in every day. For this chapter reads, every day is unique. There is no day like any other day. The good things that happen each day are forever different, forever changing. So when you do remember the magic by counting yesterday's blessings, no matter how many times you do it, it will be different every time. It's one of the reasons why remember the magic is the most powerful ongoing practice to maintain the magic of gratitude in your life. So many kai baar try kiya, bahut generic, bahut purana likhne se utna gratitude nahi aata, jab ki ab the magical stone gratitude se karte ho and then you write down in the morning your gratitude is so much more. Um, it's so much more better. Your muscle of gratitude is increasing and you're trying to find moments to be grateful for throughout your day because you know by the end of the day you will scan and in the morning you will write your gratitude. So that is why I have already intertwined this chapter in our everyday life. Of course, I will still request you to hear the playlist or read the chapter, whatever works for you. So can we turn the page, please? Even another page. So yes. Count your blessings, make a list of 10 blessings. So that's what we've been told. It's never been written. Make a list of 10 blessings of yesterday. It's just generic 10 blessings. Write why you're grateful. Reread your list and at the end of it, say thank you, thank you, thank you and feel as much gratitude for that blessing as you can. Guess what? Rhonda Byrne says, you have written 280 blessings over the course of this book. So more power to everyone that we've almost clicked off 280 blessings, which is amazing. By the end of this series, you have written one, two, one, zero blessings, you know, every single, you know, in the totality. So how wonderful. Now, remember the magic is by counting the blessings of yesterday and writing them down today morning. Ask yourself the question, what are the good things that happened yesterday? Scan the surface of yesterday until you feel satisfied. And you've covered and written down all the blessings of the day. So this scanning, I say, always goes in conjunction with the scanning at night. So, after we have done day scan, we have done a day scan, one hidden jewel. Morning, it's easier for us to just write it down. So, that's what, and all we have to do is simply say magical word, thank you, thank you, thank you, in my mind, in the end of writing in blessing. And that's what we've been doing in the night. It's a magic rock scan. So with this today, we conclude this beautiful journey, this beautiful book. 
but remember there are two three more chapters and we can continue them uh, if you wish uh, alternatively you do have that youtube session so you let me know what works for you do you want to use, uh, check them with me or you're happy to hear it on your own i'll be very happy to hear your answers so that we know we, we know which pattern we are going on in so thank you rahul sir for showcasing the magical book for these beautiful past 30 or days of introduction and in our sessions now it's time for all of us to brace up and never forget this magic this magic comes comes in a life every day some days are really terrible you know that's how life is but even in those terrible days if you start counting there's so many things that you can be actually truly blessed for so asmeet i would request you to read if it's if that's possible that will be wonderful if yes great if not even that's fine i could always continue reading this journey so if yes please raise your hand so we can unmute you and make you a co-host so yesterday <clears throat> thank you so yesterday we spoken about the three facts that we can get hooked somebody's attention hooked to what we are trying to say what was those three things can anyone you tell, tell me in the chat box what did we learn yesterday how to how to get them hooked a quick review is always important in such kind of learnings where we are doing interim learning like you just stopped it in the middle yesterday and then you know where you're moving forward three things quickly before we start reading anybody any three things so that everyone gets reminded alternatively i'm always here but i want it to come from you asmeet would you tell us on the chat box maybe or say however for the earthquake but yes lovely okay question respect okay okay what else are we missing reference question statement absolutely absolutely some time great so thank you everyone we have realized yesterday that we have to hook the attention by yes using some personal reference absolutely and the communication has we have to be open and receptive to what they're saying so that we come to the level to understand and th that's when we start our persuasion we just know that you we have now hooked their attention wonderful and it's always important to have a personal reference otherwise a person does not relate to any anything generic said by anybody it could be anybody but if i know asmeet say something to me but you do this course i've tried it and it's great i will do it but if some general person tom dick and harry comes and just says try this course and do it i will it i'll never make a difference so very important and when i communicate i must know where are you resonating from are you with me on the same page what is it that your feelings are so that's great so today we start the chapter from page number 204 from the highlight part now that you've hooked the undivided attention how do you hold it asmeet over to you good morning good morning unfortunately our attention level begins to wane or decline within 10 or 20 seconds so the next next roadblock to effective and persuasive communication is a person's declining attention span as thoughts begin to drift away to more pressing issues so if you are to if you are to effectively and persuasively communicate you need a way to keep raising the level of person's attention whenever it begins to decline this holds true whether you are speaking to a 2 year old a teenager or the ceo of a fortune 500 company 25 years ago two of the best communicators i have ever known taught me a method for raising a listener's level of attention any time it started to drift away Gary Smalley's mentor was the first person I heard who taught this method, but it was Gary himself who really taught me how to use it. I've even I've seen him use this method in one-on-one -on -one conversations, as well as when he speaks before audiences as big as seventy to eighty thousand. Like Gary, I've used it in nearly every one-one-on-one -on -one conversations. or written co correspondence that i've had in the last 25 years i've used it in my television scripts in my books and in my public speaking it is the single most effective means i have ever found of raising a person's attention level and in fact and in fact i'm using it with you right now 
this method is so powerful. I've seen it hold my four-year-olds and eight-year-olds' attention, even when there has been a group of kids waiting for them to come out and play. Now that's powerful. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You want to bet. Gary calls this method or technique salting, and it took the name from the old adage, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Gary, who owns a small farm, says this saying is absolutely untrue. He can make any horse drink every single time he leads him to the water. All he has to do is salt the horse's oat before he takes him to the water. The salt makes the horse so thirsty that he's got to take a drink. Salt has the same effect on me. There's absolutely no way that I could eat a sack of popcorn at the movies without wanting a soda at the same time. Believe it or not, there is a way you can salt your communication that will make the other person terribly thirsty for what you're going to say right next. The more you want to raise the attention level, the more salt you sprinkle into, the, into your words. This salt is a statement, a group of statements or a question that creates curiosity. When used correctly, it makes the person you're talking with Circling on the page. You're talking with or writing to want to hear what we are about to say even more than you want to say it. Three paragraphs ago, I began telling you how about the, all about this powerful communication techniques before I ever revealed what it was called or explained how it worked. I was salting you creating curiosity about this technique before I revealed it. Knowing what you know now, if you went back and reread this book, you would see that I have used the salting technique over and over again in every chapter. During my first book tour, I was interviewed by a news anchor woman for a local NBC affiliate. Early in the interview, she asked me for an example of my communication techniques. I decided to show her the power of salting without telling her what I was doing. I told her that one of the most powerful techniques I teach is a technique called salting. When she asked me to explain it, I told her that I would give her an example of how it is used. Here's what I said. You know, as I have, as I have been interviewing around the country, I've discovered that there are three things the best interviewers always do. In fact, I, I first noticed it when Maria Shriver interviewed me. And then after that, I noticed that interviewers who did all three of these things not only ended up with a lot of lot better interview, but the ones who did them on their radio call-in shows got 10 times as many calls as the ones who didn't. And I've noticed you, you I've noticed you do two of them. But if you did all three, you'd, you'd be the best interviewer in the city because you already do two of them so well. She couldn't stand waiting any longer. She reached across the desk, grabbed my arm and said, quick, tell me what they are. I said, we really don't have time now. I'll tell you after the interview, but I have just given you a great example of this salting technique. I've made you very thirsty to hear about these three interviewing techniques before I've revealed what they are. The anchor woman then interviewed me for another 40 minutes. The moment the interview was over, even before she could take microphone off her lapel, she reached across the table and grabbed my arm once again and said, now, will you please tell me what those three things are that the best interview always do? Even though she had been conducting the interviews for 40 minutes, she could not get her mind off the information that I had salted her for. That's the power of salting technique when it is correctly used. So even right now, the author is using salting technique on all of us, trying to pique our curiosity, get us so intrigued that what is the salting all about? So what did he say? 
the only thing he said is to make them thirsty to make the horse thirsty to intrigue them so much that they are on the edge of their seat like the way you know you have movies which just close on something this uh, i don't know how many of you saw this movie bahubali which came about a couple of years ago that's what they've done salting right just like even asmeet says to be continued you're just intriguing a person on what's going to come later so that the person so excited that you know he can't get off it that's what even harry potter movies or any sequel movies uh, movies or books are into they're salting us they're just tempting us they're making us so uh, anxious to know what's next what's next that's what we are all studying right now salting so now beautiful conversation is coming let me read the conversation so it says a friend of mine wanted his teenage daughter to read a biography about a woman of tremendous integrity now he read this biography himself and was so impressed with this woman he really wanted his daughter to discover the principles that had guided her life here's what he said to salt her about the book carry i've just finished reading this book about this woman and i was really impressed why for a lot of reasons she said uh, he says one thing was that she was very resourceful she fell in love with a guy who wouldn't even give her the time a uh, time of day in fact he hardly even knew she existed i know what that's like her daughter his daughter said but guess what happened what she did something that worked like magic on this guy he not only began to notice her he fell head over heels in love with her faster than she had fallen in love with him in fact he chased her so hard it was only a matter of days before he was begging her to marry him wow what did she do carry said excitedly it's too hard for me to explain but it's in the book carry grabbed the book out of my friend's hand and asked what page is it on i can't remember said the friend said my friend can you remember the chapter no but you'll find it. it's pretty fast reading with that kai took the book went to her room and finished it within 2 hours so what did we read this example he just salted her so much intrigued her so much knowing she was in a similar situation and there she was boom wham 2 hours the book is all all finished so we also can use this method in a very right fashion now what is the right fashion or what is the wrong way to do salting let's get it from asmeet when he reads for us so you can make asmeet the co-host it will be easy for him to mute or unmute so what is the right way or the wrong way to use salt so until he comes let me take it up too much salt or salting the wrong things uh, asmeet your back please read right way versus the wrong way to use salt too much salt or salting the wrong things can have negative consequences you may want salt on popcorn and steam but you probably won't uh, wouldn't enjoy it on a graham cracker or a piece of chocolate cake and even if you like salt sprinkled on your steam you probably wouldn't want it poured on the same holds true with communication you sprinkle salt into your communication when it's needed to raise a person's attention level or when you want to make a person very thirsty for an important point that you want to make if you if you pour too much salt into the conversation the person will think to himself enough already get to the point and if you use the salt for every point the important ones won't stand out so always use it to prepare your listener or reader for the most important points you want to make and use it any time you see someone starting to drift off or lose interest in what you are saying finally don't be afraid to experiment the more you use it the more proficient you will become and more effective and persuasive your communication will become so very important for us to understand that it is very powerful but any practice if it's done all the time it's never going to be great especially salting the sandwich method is good to do every time you want to just tell somebody compliments you want to compliment him and then give him a in the mi- middle criticism or a value addition it will work but salting has to be really 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 careful so now this is what we are being just guided so what are we going to do create that intrigue create that picture create that mystery so that a person wants to know more anyway now we're going to read about the most powerful communication technique i have ever used 
Let's get to it. The first technique we looked at was the hook, which is used to capture or recapture someone's undivided attention. The second technique was salting, which is used to make people thirsty for important points or information we want them to pay special attention to. The third technique is the most powerful and effective communication technique I have ever learned or used. And it is one that has been relied upon by the world's greatest communicators. Ronald Reagan, Ted Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, Mark Twain, Abraham Lincoln, Ben Franklin, and even the biblical writers and prophets used this technique regularly and skillfully to move their listeners and readers to the heights of human understanding and emotion. It is one form of communication that can simultaneously communicate to a person's mind and heart to convey understanding and emotional feelings. Gary Smalley calls this communication technique emotional word pictures. Your understanding or analytical abilities come from the left side of the brain, while your emotions or feelings come from the right. Emotional word pictures or EWPs not only bring added clarity and understanding to the left side of the brain, they can also stimulate feelings and emotions on the right. Consequently, they become the single most important tool you can use to produce effective and persuasive communication. When you use a good emotional word picture in your communication, it instantly enables the other person to understand what you are saying and feeling what and feel what you are feeling. And remember, understanding and feeling are the two elements in effective communication and two of the three elements in persuasive communication. So again, very important for us to understand that we are now reaching a conversation when emotionally we are involved, uh, mentally we're involved and we're communicating where the other person is able to understand. Very important. We to even talked about this, a paraphrasing of, repeat, of asking that person to repeat what we've said. Once a person understands what we are saying, once a person feels what we are saying, two most uh, elements are already taken care of. And the third element that we talked about in persuasion is very beautiful. We spoke about salting. We talked about hooking, we talked about salting, we talked about mind and heart coherence. So now what is an emotional word picture? Let's understand that. An emotional word picture is a word, statement or story that immediately creates a picture in listeners or readers mind that clarifies what you are trying to say and communicates a feeling that you want the listener to experience. An EWP can be as simple as a word or statement or as complex as an analogy or st short story. In chapter three, I created and used an emotional word picture that I have continued to use throughout this book. I told you about the Saturn V rocket that took American astronauts to the moon. I described its 36 story height, its five massive rocket engines, and the power it generates when it blasts off. I told you that you were just like the Saturn V rocket, except you have seven giant booster engines instead of five. I told you that most people live and die in their launching pads, never having ignited the massive engine. I said, that you were anchored to your launching pad by six chains, and that if you wanted to achieve your dream, you needed to cut these chains and ignite your seven rocket engines. This is the emotional word picture that I used to communicate an understanding and feeling about I wanted to share with you in this book. I could have chosen not to use this emotional word picture and, sim and instead simply said, there are six forces that work against the achieving of your dreams and seven potential forces that can empower you to reach them. You tell me which one you think is more effective. That best clarifies the mission of this book and best motivates you to read it. So isn't that such a strong picture that EWP, which he's portrayed for us, that emotionally we are connected with that particular image. A rocket is on the launch pad. You wanted to take go on up 
and with that to dig it up you have six chains to pull it down or you know free it of just doing it so what are you doing you're kind of imagining you're kind of resonating you're kind of relating so that is why this relational picture is very important and that is what he has used in the first chapter the very first threshold of taking a You have the book with you? I don't have it right now. Okay. If anybody has a book, we can just share the screen. Meanwhile, otherwise we can just read. We can open our PDFs. Alona, are you here? Shivani, can you follow up? Amit, uh, Rahul, sir, and check. So uh, we talked about the emotional word picture. We were reading about that. So let me just start the story again so that you can all hear. Jim and Suzette had been married for 10 years. They loved each other and adored their three children. And yet the relationship was going downhill faster than a speeding bullet. Jim was a high school principal and a football coach whose time was dominated by his school responsibilities. Suzette had tried to tell Jim that she really needed more of his attention time and help. But nothing she had seemed to make any difference. After attending a Gary Smalley seminar and learning about emotion, she tried one that she hoped for. What she was feeling is a very abbreviated account. Oh, shit. That's strange. Okay. Yeah, uh, sorry. I think this is his back. All right. Yes, so you can just read that page number 210, uh, first paragraph, Jim. Jim, <clears throat> Jim, every day you leave me and the kids early in the morning and go off to work. You start your day with the breakfast with your friends and associates and take all the time you need to talk about anything and everything you want. At the end of the meal, you take a few leftovers from your conversation, maybe a teaspoon of eggs and a corner of your buttered toast and drop them into a doggy bag. Then you do, then you go to do a lot of interesting and fulfilling things throughout the morning and throw a few of those leftovers into the same doggy bag. You go to lunch and once again, you have interesting conversations and times with, you, with those you care about. At the end of your lunch, you throw a few more leftovers into the doggy bag, maybe a little asparagus with hollandaise sauce. Your, att your attention is filled with more conversation and activities and then you go out to a nice dinner with your friends. You have a mental and emotional feast. At the end of the meal, you throw a piece of cold steak and, and the corner of a hard roll into your doggy bag. When you finally come home, I'm really excited. The kids and I haven't eaten all day. We can't wait to feast on our time and conversations with you. To hear all about the interesting things you did during the day to hear about your conversations and activities and to tell you that about and to tell you about the things we did. But when the door opens and you walk in, you simply hand us the doggy the soggy bag of leftovers and walk into the TV room and watch television until you go to bed. Jim, the kids and I are tired of doggy bags every night. We want to feast on you and have quality time and conversation with you. Jim was deeply moved by her word picture 
and then gave her one that clarified how he often felt when he came home. Sue, remember your grandfather's little puppy? So its happiest childhood memories were of her times with her grandfather and his dogs. When I got off to work, it's kind of like grandpa's puppy digging out of the yard and going off into a scary world. I go out and I get chased by big bad dogs. These dogs catch me and bite me and scare the crud out of me. Later, I run into some great big humans and they throw rocks at me. One hits me in the head and really hurts. Another hits me in the tailbone and I don't think I'll ever be able to sit up for grandpa again, no matter what kind of bone he offers me. I then run into a big tomcat. He scratches my back and leg and opens up a cut right above my eye. I pick up all kinds of briars and thorns on the way home. And all I can think about is getting back to my nice, comfortable home and seeing grandpa. I think about the food he'll give me, how he'll get all the thorns out and put me in nice, comfortable doggy bed. I finally see grandpa's house. I'm so happy I want to run, but I'm too exhausted and hurting too much. I crawl back under his fence and go up to the doorstep. He opens the door and I get all excited. I bark out, Grandpa. But as soon as he sees me, he grabs a broom and starts yelling at me and hitting me. You ungrateful mutt, how dare you dig a hole under my fence and run off? Whack, whack. Get back up here. I'm not finished talking to you. And he hits me again. Whack, whack. Sue, that's how you make me feel when I come home from a hard day at work and you instantly greet me at the door and start complaining about all the things I haven't done. That's a message for everyone who's welcoming their partners or their parents when they're back home, how we just attack them with all our day stuff, not knowing what that person has had throughout the day. This is something that he's portraying such a strong emotional word picture to his spouse who's saying that enough of doggy bags, now it's time for it. Such a beautiful picture he's portrayed, showing him ups and downs of life throughout the day. And this is what he comes to, to not be greeted well, not to be given that warm hug, that, you know, city it's a man or a woman's heart. So now this is what we are being under, made to understand that create an emotional picture, create an emotional word picture, because that is how men or women are greeted when they're back. They've had a full day and that's when sometimes the antennas go up because you touch in the wrong spot. So let's be careful about this. This emotional word picture probably came to us in this morning for us to relate, authentic relate, re, relation of whatever is happening, right? So yes, I know a lot of husbands would be wondering where their wives are because they are the ones who usually come back from work. So yes, this is also for some women who come back from work. So yes, please, let's continue this emotional word picture. Okay, how lovely. All right. <clears throat> Now, the unique thing about any emotional word picture is that it can often be very meaningful to the people who are communicating and totally irrelevant to anyone outside the situation. While these word pictures may not have been effective with you or me, they were incredibly powerful and effective with Jim and Suzette. After he finished his word picture, Suzette cried for more than an hour and then asked his forgiveness. He was so moved by her word picture he resigned from his job and took one that would not only give him a lot more time with Sue and the kids, but would not leave him as emotionally and physically drained so that when he come home, when he came home, he would have the emotional and physical energy he needed to give his family the attention he felt they deserved. While emotional word pictures can be stories such as these, they can also be in the form of a much simpler analogy. One couple I know uses the analogy of a savings account. If Joe does something that offends Patty or hurts her feelings, she'll tell him, you just made a withdrawal. Well, Joe then asks, a big one or a little, or a little one? If Patty says just a few bucks, Joe knows 
it was only a minor offense. If she says a giant one, bigger than our entire house women, then he knows it's serious. I've ever heard, I've even heard Joe say in response, what could I do right now that would be a deposit bigger than the withdrawal I just made? As you can see, they can be very simple, yet it's extremely effective. So it's very important for us to understand that authentic relating has to happen. In this picture, while he's portraying the, uh, he's used a dog as his image, his wife has understood that very clearly, but even he has realized that his job is so hard hitting that he's got no time at all for to give back to his family, which is very, very important part of growing up. So he resigns from his job and takes on a new one and she stops back him when she's back. It's a win-win situation. Sometimes an emotional word picture runs both ways. You're trying to communicate with somebody. She or he has got the communication, but so have you got the communication because the other person has spoken about it. And even the, the last one tiny paragraph about the same account, it's so beautiful, the way it's articulated, because you're kind of comparing it now. So that is why sometimes, you know, that's why they say words, uh, pictures speak louder than words, which is why you develop an emotional word picture so that you just res resonate with that single word and you create the entire emotion around it. So let's understand the five most important steps to begin using emotional word pictures. Now we've understood the power of emotional word pictures. These five steps we'll be studying tomorrow in detail when we start our chapter from page number 212. Until today, let's understand what kind of emotional word pictures can you and I use to make a referential talks and conversations, communication with whoever we are meant to be, whether it's uh, within the family, it's in your personal world or your professional world. Let's understand that we are going to be using them with whatever tools we've learned yesterday and today about our communication. So this chapter is beautiful. It's also a very, very impactful chapter. So we'll continue it tomorrow. So thank you, Rahul, sir. Well, let's take this journey forward tomorrow. And now it's time for us to your uh, Namaskar sun salutations. The Surya Namaskar with mantras. Om Mitraye Namaha. Om Ravaye Namaha. Om Suryaye Namaha. Om Bhanave Namaha. Om Khagaye Namaha. Om Kushne Namaha. Om Hiranyagarbhaya Namaha. Om Marichai Namaha Om Adityai Namaha Om Savitre Namaha Om Arkai Namaha Om Bhaskarai Namaha Salutations to the Universal Friend Salutations to the Resplendent Sun Salutations to the Energy that induces activity within us. Salutations to the one who illumines. Salutations to the sun moving across the sky. Salutations to the giver of strength. Salutations to the golden cosmic self. Salutations to the lord of the dawn. Salutations to the son of Aditi, the cosmic mother. Salutations to the benevolent mother. Salutations to the energy that we praise and to the one who guides us to salvation. The sun salutation now with the names of the postures, both in Sanskrit and English. Pranamasan, Hastuthanasan, Madhahastasan, Left leg back, Ashwasanchalanasan, Parvatasan. And hold this position and now slowly progressing into the deeper version of Parvatasan, Adho Mukshvanasan. Ashtang Namaskar, Bhujangasan, 
पर्वतासन लेफ्ट फॉरवर्ड अश्व संचलन आसन पद हस्तासन हस्तोत्थनासन प्रणाम आसन ऑन द राइट साइड प्रे पोजिशन रेज राम स्पोर्ट हंड टू फीट फोर्ड राइट लेग बैक इक्वेस्ट्रियन फोर्ड mountain pose hold mountain pose and slowly moving into the deeper version of mountain the downward facing dog salute with eight limbs cobra press back to mountain right forward equestrian pose hand to feet pose raise down position prayer pose one round of the sun salutation with awareness on the breathing so exhaling our hands to the chest pranam inhaling as we bend back we exhale as we fold forward left leg back inhale as we are arching back exhale into the forward Hold the breath for knees, chest, chin. Inhale as we arch back. Exhale into the forward. Left leg forward. Inhale. This is a back bend. Exhale whenever we bend forward. Inhale as we bend back. Exhale. Hands to the chest. And on the right, deep breathing. Exhale. A deep inhale. A long exhale. Right leg back with an inhale. And exhale. Hold the breath. Inhale. And exhale. Right leg forward with a deep inhale. Exhale. Inhale. All right. Today's chapter is beautiful. It's about politics and government. It's something that all of us have been questioning, all of us have been uh, wondering. And this book also in this chapter brings you timelines. A lot of you have been wondering about the timeline, which world we talking about it. Yesterday, I got a very beautiful question. We've been talking about the new world. When is it coming? So here we are. The simple answer was whenever we are ready, it's coming. But this chapter is going to give us timelines also. So let's read about politics and government. Thank you, Asneet, for reading so beautifully. I think I've been missing your voice. Thank you for lending it so beautifully today morning. And now let me take you through this gorgeous chapter of, on this beautiful learning. Uh, chapter number 15, it's about politics and government. So the original framers of the constitution of the US almost got it right. The concept was great of having a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. However, the implementation did not go as ideally as the concept of democracy. For most of our recorded history, mankind has been ruled by authoritarian, dictatorial and fascist regimes where the common citizen does not have much say in the development, implementation or enforcement of the laws and rules. Monarchs, Maharajas, kings, queens, dictators, tyrants. In all these systems that we have been using since ancient times, there's typically one person at the top who has total and uncontestable power and authority. He or she can do pretty much anything that they like, and there's absolutely nothing that anyone can do about it. So how did this one person get to the top of the pyramid? How often it is simply by birth into a, most often it is simply by birth into a royal family. Can you think of a more gross, unfair and unjust system? And yes, we just accept, and yet we just accept it and submissive, submissively live with it. So is democracy the answer? It was to overcome injustice the framers of the US constitution came up with the idea of trying democracy. 
if people could vote on the various issues, then no single person is making the rules and the majority rule prevails. But how do you get people to vote on the issues? There were many practical problems. To overcome these, it was decided that groups of people should elect a representative by major majority vote, and the representatives would then get together to vote on various issues. Whatever the majority of representatives vote on will be adopted as a law. But there are some serious systematic problems with this approach. This is why we have a president of the US who got fewer votes than his opponent did. Is that a fair system? Is that a system we desire? So what is the voting process? Let us say we have an election. 60% of the qualified citizens vote and one particular candidate gets 55% of the vote and is elected. Now you have a representation that only 33% of citizens voted for. Is he or she really representing the entire group? A vote for him only signifies that he was judged to be better than his opponent. It does not mean that he agrees with everyone that voted for him. In the best situation, he's representing a minority of his constituents. On certain issues, that number may be even smaller. But what about days when he misses a vote completely? Now, how, how are his constituents being represented at all? And what if some special interest groups offer him some special consideration or bribes in common language to vote in a certain way? Now he has to make a choice. He can vote the way the special interest group wants him to vote and gain the incentives, or vote the way his constituents would want, would have wanted him to vote and get nothing. He's a smart guy, which is how he won the election. He knows what is good for him. By voting his conscience, not only does he lose out on an incentive, but also most probably he will lose the next election, since the special interest would put the resources and support his opponent in the next election. He's not stupid. He knows what is good for him. At least 95% of all politicians around the world, world vote with the special interest groups. So are we getting true representation about 2-3% of the time? Is that a good and fair system? Just like communism, democracy appears good on the surface, but the implementation and actual functioning of such system is far from perfect. With a 2-3% participation level, what else can we expect anyways? The election that was not. All of the above problems may arise even if we assume that the election itself was totally honest and fair. What if the ballets are counted incorrectly? whether intentionally or mistakenly? What if the election rules are incorrect? What if the voters are unable to get the voting booths for any reason? What if the ballots are thrown away or misplaced intentionally or accidentally? The list of potential problems can go on and on. It is almost impossible to quantify the effects of these. Now it's time for technology to it brings to rescue. Someone had a bright idea. It appears that humans are causing more of these problems in either intentionally or as human errors. If we were to use machines for voting, we would eliminate these problems. So they replaced the manual ballots with voting machines. But the situation got worse. The black box of technology. Armed with the information that new computerized voting machines are now in place, Mr. Voter gets <clears throat> goes confidently to vote. He has a touchscreen to vote for candidate A, out of choice A, B, C, D. When, he, when he's done, the screen flashes done. Thank you, and then goes blank. Mr. Voker, voter walks out thinking he's done the right thing, but there's absolutely no proof of whom he voted for. No printout or any other hard copy. Mr. Voter talks to a lot of people and an overwhelming majority say they voted for the same candidate A. He goes to bed happy. He knows the candidate will be the winner. He wakes up the next morning and surprise, candidate D has won by a wide majority. What happened? The black box worked perfectly. A private company designs and programs a voting machine. The software for data input and processing is their proprietary program, not available to the general public for inspection or verification. No proof is provided for the data input. 
when Mr. Voter touches the screen thinking he's voting for A, did the machine really note that as a vote for A or did it count it as a vote for D? No idea. With no backup hard copy proof of the real data being entered, there's absolutely no way to double check or verify the machine is functioning as it should. If the machine manufacturer is part of the special interest group that is supporting candidate D, the machine can easily be programmed to declare the result in favor of candidate D. And there's absolutely no way to dispute the, uh, the results. But isn't that a perfect way to steal elections? Ah. You got it. Elections are being stolen as you read this book. So technology alone is not the answer. That is why our elections are rigged, right? Now we turn the black box into a white box. How do we do that? For the machine to work the way they really meant to, two things are very essential. First, hard copy backup of data input. When a person votes, they need to be given a printout of whom they have voted for so they can verify that the vote has been tallied correctly. At the same time, the same information needs to go to a third party, not connected with the personnel at the voting booth or with the people programming the machine. So a later audit can be conducted if necessary. Number two, open access to the programming code. Any outside party should be able to verify the final results are being tallied correctly and match the input data. Now, who needs a representative? Even if the election fraud is eliminated totally, we still need, we still end up with a representative who typically represents a minority of his constituents and does not necessarily vote like they would like him to. So why do we need him in the first place? For a few more years, as you continue in the third dimension, we still need the representatives for two major reasons. We are still operating on systems that were designed in 18th century over 225 years ago. And because technology is not ubiquitous at the moment to allow people to vote directly. So voting in the new world. Now, in the new world or the fourth dimension, everyone will have constant access technology that is connected to the equivalent of the internet or the worldwide web, only WWW. Every issue that requires a vote can be voted directly by the people themselves. There will be sufficient time given for people to vote on an issue. It is not like a current vote in parliament where it is only at a specific time. And if you're not present, you miss the opportunity to vote. Everyone will have enough spare time and a sense of civic responsibility to regularly monitor the decisions that require a vote and vote their conscience. The process will be very, very simple. If an issue only requires a regional vote, only people in that region will be able to look at it and vote on it. The result tally for all votes will be freely available to everyone at all times. Why would we need any representations, representatives then? No representative needed, no election fraud. People's will is being truly reflected in all the decisions. No special interest, no bribes, legal or illegal. All we would need are administrators, but all activities of the administrations will be transparent to everyone. So isn't that wonderful that it's sounding so amazing? Now let's hear about the politics of war. Since we operate in a world where the top person makes the decisions, Generally, that person has uncontested power and authority. The person may develop a big ego since he feels that he can do no wrong. And everyone has to submit to his will and power. The bigger the ego grows, the more drunk on power he becomes. Power means control and ownership. Unless one controls, one cannot feel the power. So they need more and more things to own and more people to control. Greed and control become the driving force for the person. Hence, the need develops for conquering others to increase the span of control and own more things. Since others do not want to be subjugated, force has to be used. Then starts the war. 
the trouble with war is that it is self-perpetuating. The, the winner feels even more powerful and develops an addiction to acquire more and more power and ownership. The loser wants revenge and wants to take back what he lost. Thus, both the winner and the loser end up perpetuating the war. It becomes a vicious circle of violence. So we're seeing this, right? It's happening all the time. Right now, so many parties are fighting with each other. One wins, even the others, waiting for the next election. And they're trying to create those problems in a nice governance also. People are still trying to create that problem because they don't want that government to be victorious. Now comes the part, no nations, no war. It is only a sovereign nations that fight with each other. For example, in the US, the state of New York does not attack the neighboring state of New Jersey. Similarly, in India, for example, the state of Rajasthan does not attack the neighboring state of Gujarat. In the new world, we will have no nations. The entire world will be a global village. Then who is going to attack whom? The politics of peace. In the new world, peace will prevail. Since people will have no desire to hurt anyone and no desire to take their property. The prevalence of unconditional love means accepting people as they are and considering everyone to be at the same level. If you have no desire to prove yourself as superior to anyone else, you have no desire to control them. If you have no desire to control anyone, you will never get into any violent situations. Peace comes automatically when everyone operates from unconditional love. So a lot is coming our way. Uh, there will be no need for military um, industrial complex. We've talked about that in a very basic form in which industries will not be thriving in the new world. Also tomorrow, there'll be a lot of chapters coming up with timelines. So you'll get to know what is happening, what has happened, what is going to happen. With the defined timeline, you'll be able to relate to it probably okay, this is what's happened. This is what's not happened. As I said, this book is a channel book. It comes with definite guidelines. So <clears throat> let's embrace the change and let's go for tomorrow, which is going to be, we're going to be so thankful for so many new learnings and we'll be able to authentically relate to it. So more power to each one of us as we talk about tomorrow's chapter. So thank you so much, sir, for showing this. Uh, chapter. It's just a one-page chapter, two-page chapter left for tomorrow, but nonetheless, we'll do it tomorrow. So, okay, today it's time for a hard thought. Let's go for it. Um, right. Sorry, today I think there's some problem with the connection. So, here we are. So, very important for us to understand that we are in this journey and we need to first love ourselves and accept ourselves exactly as we are. So unless that happens, none of us can really go on in our journey. So thank you so much uh, for, to the readers, Asmeet and Dushalu, for your wonderful reading. And today, is there anything that you want to meditate on? So if yes, let me know so that I can take it up. Otherwise, we can just do whatever. Let's uh, check our postures. Shivani, are you the co-host? Yeah. Yes, you are. Let's check our postures. Our back straight. Our feet firmly placed on the ground below. Our eyes softly closed and a soft smile on our faces. Let it be breath in, fill ourselves with love. Feel the love pulsating in your body and gently exhale. Inhale in light. You're able to see the world, world clearly from inner eyes. And as you feel, 
you're able to see the world more beautifully externally. Let's inhale strength. We are strong mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, intellectually. And as we exhale, we share our light with the world of our strength. Life is a healer. Life shows us all shades of life with positivity and negativity, each important. Life shows us the corrective path. It's in us to make a choice. So let's embrace this beautiful life in totality as a whole, knowing that each one of us can make the choice we deserve. Let's tell ourselves we deserve the very best and we choose the very best because we are divinely guided. We invest in our holistic growth. When it comes to our body, we nurture the desire to be a healthier version of ourselves. So we put in the right food, the right thoughts, and give ourselves the perfect diet of thoughts and food, which improves our cellular energy and giving us a body fit for furthering our path of spiritual awakening. We read new things, creating a mindful space of learning and growth. We are now operating from a world of heart because we've realized the true amalgamation integration of heart and mind. Heart being part of the physical body and yet most important for anything to do with mind. Only the coherence makes it possible for us to do something. And when the two come together, we're doing something which is soulful. And there is a play of our willpower that will invoke in us. When our heart is emotional, feeling right emotions, and our mind is giving us a dialogue, we are truly called mindful and heartful. And that's when we become thankful because we're learning to do something with full gratitude, knowing it's for the highest best. We are willing our will to take us on a step further. We're invoking more energy and adding it to our willpower, powering the will for us to do something in life. Just because we're meant to do it. Just because by now, we are heartful, we are mindful. Now it's no longer a pressure. It's no longer a compulsion. And if it is, then it's not meant to happen. Then all we do is surrender. That whatever happens, happens to truly the best. We are in this beautiful spiritual world, evolving every single day, learning the finer nuances for living our life, learning and imbibing and sharpening our already prevalent virtues, honing our skills with the beautiful irreplaceable, knowledgeable bank that's coming our way every single morning. We have thoughts to ponder on. It gives us some matter to read, to reflect on. 
making us more analytical, more reflective. And hence, we are becoming the better versions of ourselves. It's raising an attitude of questioning in our mind. The most important virtue of a seeker, which we all are. The more we seek, the more we get. We're now delving in the deeper oceans and finding the pearls within. Aham Brahmasmi. I am the ultimate universe. Whatever I'm finding outside is hidden within me. As I, and as I take a step within me, I realize the true value of wisdom and words, of strength, integrity, and all things wonderful. Let there be love, let there be light. Let each one traverse on the path of goodness, choosing what's meant to be for the highest best. Where the each one exercises the willpower, which automatically is a gift of coherence of mind and heart. Where each one of us is positivity induced, each one of us is healthy. Each one of us is learning to grow holistically by giving equal importance to all spheres of growth. Today we have learned the most important lesson of integrity, where it's important for us to get our financial goals it's as important for us to get our emotional and personal goals. Now everything is beautifully balanced because we all are reaching and entering the world of spirituality step by step. Discovering the unlimited magic there. By now, each one of us has been in a journey of gratitude for a month and we're ready to evolve and take our game a little higher. So let's be grateful for whatever is coming our way, which is nothing but sheer magic. And so it is. Let's bow in gratitude towards Mother Earth, express our gratitude, express our love, express our light, and thank her for showering us with all the beautiful virtues, especially love and light. Today we promise you Mother Earth that each one of us will work on our consciousness, live life with more awareness and elevate ourselves. When we are in this world of ascension, you too shall ascend. And together we will be a better place for us to live in, for others to live in. And so it is. Let's look at a life level and be so grateful for whatever downs we've gone through. Each down, each challenge made us tougher, stronger, more authentic. And each one of us have learned lessons, have had experiences, which have nurtured us with strength, vigor, and thoughtfulness. Each up helped us learn something more in life, made us more happy, and we bask in attention. Tomorrow is absolutely wonderful. Because right now I'm nurturing the seeds of oneness in me, the seeds of being complete and whole. With this foundation, tomorrow it will be absolutely rock solid. And so it is. Let's open our hands in gratitude towards Mother Earth, towards the universe, towards life, towards everything that the world has for us. Totality of everything. Today, let's include heavens and earth together in one big round of gratitude towards the universe. Dear universe, each one of us is resonating at a higher vibra vibration, the higher frequency. Let us attract whatever is highest best for us. With open arms, we embraced our life. Thank you for giving us so much. Thank you 
Thank you. Thank you. To all the ascended masters, teachers, and gurus in this realm or the others, in this dimension or the others, thank you for using us as channels of love, light, and blessings. Each one of us open receptive and to share our knowledge, our light. To all the divine beings, thank you for using us. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for blessing us. To all the angels and guardians, thank you for ensuring we are one. Let's expand our angel heart. I am love. I am light. I shine bright. Right now, right here. Wherever I turn, prosperity follows. I'm a believer in my dreams, in goodness, in oneness, and so it is. Let's fold our hands in gratitude for everything from heaven to earth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's rub our hands together. Feel the energy flow, the warmth, the tingling. Bless our wonderful face with the five senses. Our neck, shoulders, arms, back, upper, middle, lower, spinal cord, hips, extremity organs, back of our thighs, back of our knees, back of our calves, soles of our feet, upper part of our feet, front of our calves, knees, front thighs, sexual organs, large intestines, small intestines, uterus, kidneys, gallbladder, stomach. Let's bless our lungs. Feel a heartbeat, bless it. Now let's fold our hand in gratitude once more for this magical body that we live in, which we're learning to respect and grow beautifully. Dearest body, whatever dis-ease you have in you, whatever discomfort you have in you, please feel free to detox yourself, rid yourself of it. Eliminate as simply as you can. Because you and me do not need any toxicity in our body. Let us now be so beautiful, whole and complete, to help us evolve further. And so it is. Thank you to trillions of cells, the 100,000 kilometers of blood circulation system, the muscles, tissues, fibers, glands, bones, and skin. Thank you for integrating as one. With the energy that flows in us, let us share our love and light with each one of us and have the wishful blessings. Lots of love and light, Ritu, Manish, Supriya, Jagdeep, Ruchi, Vijayji, Pratima Ji, Asmeet, Akshay, Pina Ji, Neha, Shami, Ankur, Shivani, Usha Ji, Manisha, Shalu, Jitendra Ji, Amit, Kamakshi, Minakshi, Kunjan Ji, Surendra Ji, Kuldeep Ji, Ruvan Parul, Sunakshi Mohindra, Ruchi, Neha, Alona, Rahul Sir, Amita Ma'am, thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you for spending this beautiful morning with me, making it more magical. And thank you for sharing your reflections and thank you for being in integrity. But one thing which I'm observing is that the assignments which are done every day are not too many. Rahul and Amrita have been sending us the, the entire analysis of the assignments. Please come in there, do send your, uh, you know, your updates because Amrita does send you the links. All they have to do is click and just put it because it will help you in more accountability, more answerability to yourself. You have decided to give one to one days here. So the least we can do is our assignments. So please I request you, please do it with sincerity. Any questions, any reflections? Otherwise, we can meet each other tomorrow at five. All right. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize for all the um, technical glitches we've had this morning with the connections. Hopefully, it will all be sorted very soon. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of love and light.